Hello, and welcome to Tales from the Trunk, reading the stories that did make it. I'm Hilary B. Bismiex. Listeners, I am super, super excited to introduce you today to the author of Infomocracy and, most recently, The Mimicking of Known Successes. Malka Older, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's so great to be here. Yeah, I'm... uh, I'm so pumped to have you on, and especially for such a gorgeous-looking book. I haven't read it yet, obviously, because this is February and I didn't get an arc, but uh, the cover has just blown me away, and uh, I'm super excited to get into it. Yeah, I really appreciate the work that Tor.com did on the cover to make it just... I think I think it looks a lot like what it is, which is like, Mm-hmm. warm and bright and fun and stars and planets and rockets and yeah really we love this it. we love mm-hmm. this and like shouts in general to the tour.com team they do fantastic work uh yeah i don't think i've picked up a tour.com book that hasn't just like knocked it out of the park on production values yeah i really appreciate all their work on production on publicity on obviously the artwork and design is amazing and my experience working with them has just been really really positive also in terms of how they deal with authors and and I also want to give a shout out to my editor for this book um Brent Lambert who oh hell yeah Brent yes who is who's doing um acquiring for tour without being so just to make sure he doesn't get lost in that bubble of tour.com he did such great work uh, on the editing of this, and he's been so good to work with on getting it all the way through the process. So yeah, uh, I'm constantly in awe of Brent's work. And he has a book coming out, which is really exciting. And he has a book coming out, even better. <laughs> um, so before we get into the reading, is there anything that we need to know about the mimicking of known successes? Sure. So this is um, a book that I wrote. Kind of, so it was, it was, I think I started it towards the end of 2020, um, actually for Nano Remo, my, or Nano Rimo, depending where you fall in that schism. Um, mm-hmm. My sort of book title was Blank, but Make It Fun. Because I was like, I just, I need to write something that is fun. I and remember that. And because that was all I could read at that point in 2020. Um, mm-hmm. And so I was kind of thinking about all the, the books that I love to read when I need comfort. And a shocking number of them are murder mysteries, which is a bit <laughs> like um, not even all cozy murder mysteries. So there's mm-hmm. there's some there's something about that. But I think there's something really powerful about the um this the sort of trope line of something that's wrong and then it gets solved using mm-hmm. logic and intuition and searching and work and whatever it takes and then and then something gets resolved. So there was that and then I've been reading a lot of romance, so I was thinking about romance, and I was just thinking about like being cozy inside on a stormy day. And so somehow <laughs> this connected with an idea that I'd had for a long time about how people would live on a gas giant. Oh. Um, and so here we are with a sort of gas punk murder mystery set on Jupiter. Um, we love this. Yeah. So things to know, the inhabitants call this planet a uh, giant. It is Jupiter, but I feel like once it became your home planet, it would be kind of weird to keep referring to it mm-hmm. as, by the name of a god from a civilization that is <laughs> no longer around and hasn't been for a while. And it's just, it seemed That's, like a good makes idea. Makes sense. You want, and, and where you live is so fundamental. Like if you think about Earth. Okay, mm-hmm. so, so anyway, so they call it giant. Um, it's been several hundred years since they had to abandon Earth. So there's been enough time for what was initially a really desperate settlement to build up into something with some surplus and some culture and mm-hmm. so on. Um, and one of the things that they're very focused on uh, is the whole academic specialty focusing on Earth, um, particularly Earth ecosystems. Um, anything related to Earth academically is called classical. Oh, and anything cool. about giant itself is called modern. Because mm-hmm. so there's, there's a, a time thing. Um, and so the one of the main characters, the one who is, is speaking as the first person narrator, narrator, whose name is Platy, 
um, is a scholar of uh, a classical scholar who basically reads earth books mm -hmm. to and, and then um, quantifies the species mentioned in them <sighs> as part of trying to figure out what is the right balance of, for an ecosystem to oh, receive earth neat. once it's possible and be able to move back. Um, and uh, the other main character, whose name is Masa, is an investigator on this planet, which is someone who looks for people who are lost or tries to figure out things that have gone missing or gone weird or um, there's something strange going on. It's, mm -hmm. uh, so, and they are ex-girlfriends from I love this for them. university. <laughs> yes, it's, it's uh, like I said, everything that I wanted to read in a comfort book mm -hmm. is here. So, um, so at this point in the book, um, Martha has come to Platy because the, the missing person she's investigating was from the university where Platy works. Oh. And they are going to investigate the place where he left from on his faithful last uh, rail car ride. This, the settlements on this gas giant are platforms that are on and connected by rings, um, geosynchronous rings around oh, the planet. Nice. And then they have train-like rail cars that go between them. Love a train. Um, yeah, so they're journeying to uh, the place where this person left from before he disappeared. And that place is the Kofra Institute for Earth Species Preservation, which was established only shortly after Giant was settled by a geneticist named Krell Kofra. It was astonishing now to see it. Platform after platform branching out from the conjunction of two rings that formed the station. Unlike most platforms on Giant, these were layered, steps leading up to new areas, so that you could get some sense of the scale from the rail car, even if you couldn't see how far it stretched to either side, which I knew was very far indeed. Hmm. There had, after all, been many species on Earth once. Even the small subset of that number whose genetic information had been collected before they were driven out of existence, and the far smaller fraction of those who had been resurrected for the mausoleum still resulted in an extremely large panoply of species. An extraordinary amount of space had been dedicated to recreating their habitats in this entirely hostile environment. It was an almost unthinkable extravagance on a planet where there was no land that had not been constructed. Agricultural and residential space were still considered dreadfully scarce. But the mausoleum had been created in a post-traumatic moment. Hmm. Kafra had been part of the biopreservationist movement at the end of the world and used their moral and scientific legitimacy to argue that keeping the species of Earth in their potential form in seed banks and on data caches was not enough. That as many examples as possible should be gestated into living plants and animals. Moreover, during the initial settlement, scientists, biological and social, were deeply, almost hysterically concerned about the consequences of living on a planet with no other life larger than microbes. Gestating Earth species was considered a necessity for humans. Now, with cats and cockroaches infesting almost every platform, the extravagant facilities developed to address that concern seemed laughable. But the administrators of the Preservation Institute had guarded its historic privilege jealously, and their links with Valdegeld University helped protect it as well. How, after all, would Earth ever be restored if the animals and plants could not be reconstituted or could not be cared for once they were? How could the project of restoration and reseeding, the entire purpose of the vaunted field of classical studies, be understood without access to this living resource? And many non-scholars visited as well, finding some importance in seeing for themselves these creatures and plants, even if they were not quite in their native habitat, hmm. a respite perhaps, or a warped window on what our lost life on earth might have been like. I had visited often enough for my work that I had my routine of where to look on the approach. Out the right side of the car and up to the mid-level platform, where if I was lucky, I would catch the wide stripes of a zebra. The feeding trough for the mammoths just beyond that. 
then to the left where a field of wildflowers bordered the rail. Just beyond them, the jaguar could sometimes be spotted if it chose to lounge near the edge of its habitat. Hmm. Back to the right for the giant tortoise. And, almost invisible, at the very upper limit of the window, a dark blur that I knew to be a vat of fantastically rare and expensive soil, literal earth, populated with worms. There were, of course, animal rights activists who argued that the animals shouldn't have been reconstituted to live in what was essentially captivity. This perspective had not picked up many adherents. Probably, I always thought, because many of the species in the mausoleum had more space to wander around in than most human residential platforms offered. If they were in captivity on this inhospitable planet, then so were we. Mm. And we're just going to skip the meeting that they have at the Institute to afterwards. It was well past midnight when we left the meeting. I was weary, my sleep on the train not having been very restful, and Masa must have been too. I hadn't even asked which diurnal she was on. And yet it seemed a shame to drag her back to Valdegeld so quickly. Have you ever been here? I asked. We could walk one of the tourist paths before we return if you like. <laughs> Masa acquiesced willingly enough. Odd for her, she was usually single-minded to a fault. And I chose one of the shorter circuits in deference to our long day of working. It had been some time, years, I realized, since I had walked around the mausoleum without some specific purpose and destination in mind. And despite my familiarity with the environment, I still found it impressive. Mm. The paths we walked, made of the same coated and reinforced metal as all platforms, had been carved or pressed with the images of various classical organisms or of the traces they might leave creating the illusion of fossils in the ground or footprints and spore leading to a watering hole. The illusion that there was some ingrained history of life on this planet. Lamps guttered bluely at intervals, leaving the pathway dim, but the habitats, all some little distance away and protected by transparent walls, glowed brightly with an approximation of what sunlight would look like on Earth. Hmm. I found the walk and the unaccustomed images helped to clear my head, Perhaps that was Masa's reasoning for agreeing. But odd that Masa should think that way. She didn't. Of course she didn't. You think something important happened here, I said suddenly, breaking our ruminative silence. To Bolian before he left. You think his time here was decisive? It seems likely, Masa responded, but I'm far from certain. You did mention that he looked unusual when you saw him at the station before he came here. I nodded, wondering if I had been correct or was recording over my memory in light of what I now knew. In any case, it deserves an hour for getting a better sense of the place. I will say, she added, looking down the deliberately twisting path ahead of us, he certainly does not seem the type to wander aimlessly around a place which he visits frequently. Hmm. Unless he was truly distraught, I suggested, but when Masa turned her skeptical glance on me, I held up my hands immediately. No, I agree. He must have come here for a reason. I hope we may find out soon whom he met with, what they spoke of. Indeed, Masa replied, and I cast her a sharp look, hmm. unconvinced by her tone, but the dimness had overtaken us and I couldn't read her expression. It is late, she added, turning her face briefly to the dragonfly enclosure, its walls pocked with magnifiers. Shall we return? Hmm. Yes, I agreed with a sigh. Sila would contact us if anyone responded, and there seemed no reason to remain at the Institute to wait. Er, it would be awkward whether I offered her a place to stay or didn't. I attempted, therefore, to determine which outcome I would prefer. <laughs> Normally, I enjoy my solitude. In particular, I was still enamored of my scholar's room, so much more comfortable than the very tolerable space I had enjoyed at Valdegeld as a student. I savored my every arrival in them, closed the door behind me with a sense of sufficiency and safe enclosure. There was a small guest room with a narrow bed attached, and while I gloried in the idea of inviting someone, in student days we had to reserve the shared guest room of the hall or content ourselves with blankets on the floor. Mm -hmm. I had not yet had occasion to do so, and my rooms felt inviolate. And yet... Though my eyes sagged with weariness, the thought of spending this evening alone chimed incomplete. 
It must be, I told myself, the allure of the mystery. Surely mm -hmm. Martha had some additional reflections that she might share in the ease of an overnight. And in any case, Mossa hardly counted as a guest. <laughs> You'll stay at mine, of course, I said, therefore, as jovially as I could manage as we turned back towards the station. The assumption of normalcy was, I thought, my best strategy. I remembered also I should clarify the situation. As a scholar, I have space for a guest, only a closet, really, but you'll be quite comfortable. <laughs> and you still owe me that meal. Asa grunted. Mm. As soon as we can manage it without events overtaking us, she said. And I had turned to ask whether she expected events to occur soon and of what sort, when a blur sprang through the air, slamming her to the hard metal of the platform. I found myself breathless, but managed to topple towards her, screaming in some combination of alarm and anger. There were, I remembered as I staggered forward, emergency buttons studded on the railings along the walkways. My fingers found the hard edge of one and swept across it as I directed a kick, poorly aimed and worse balanced, at the vibrating clutch of muscle and pelt that crouched on Masa's curled body. The animal hissed at me, but my boots were heavy ones, and it was at least distracted enough to focus its eyes and its claws towards me. I kicked again, swiped my sleeve-wrapped arm in its general direction in an attempt to frighten it. I was still bellowing for assistance, but I couldn't imagine anyone coming. I bethought myself of another weapon and snatched an ignition from my pocket. In the platform's oxygenated atmosphere, it created only a small spark, but I waved it as close to the beast as I dared, hoping to trigger some epigenetic fear of flame. It bared its glistening sharp teeth at me some sort of feline, my classically trained brain informed me. <laughs> and then, quick as lightning, it whipped back to look over its shoulder and sprang into the night. I collapsed to the platform, choking with residual shock before I could stop myself and dragged myself to Moss's side without coming upright. To my relief, she was already rolling and in a moment I saw her face draped in her atmoscarp and apparently unscathed. I found I was running my hands over her shoulders and arms to reassure myself she was unharmed, most naturally, and I stopped <laughs> myself at once. You're well? Masa was uncurling herself and managed a sitting position. Unharmed, and very grateful that this facility apparently keeps their caracals well fed. <laughs> and to you, of course. <laughs> the afterthought was so typical of Masa, and if I was fair, in this case so accurate, that I barely felt its sting. I take it that's not a usual occurrence. I laughed felt the giggles of release tension on its edge and stopped quickly. Hardly. You're really unhurt. Can you stand? I helped her to her feet and held her arm as we started back towards the station. I kept glancing around for a swift moving shadow and she repeated her question. No, I said more clearly. I have never heard of an animal getting loose here. Although, hmm? She had not disengaged her arm, but she wasn't leaning on me either, or, or at least not much. I looked around again. I suppose it's not the sort of thing they would want people to know about. Certainly not. When we reached the station, I wanted to settle Masa in the waiting train while I informed the staff about the escape, but she wouldn't hear of it. And so we both went into the administrative building and told the first person we found. It was a little difficult to extricate ourselves. What with their anxiousness to confirm that we wouldn't spread the event all over the ring, <laughs> but we managed to board the train just before it left. Altogether, a very instructive visit, Masa said. She was sitting very straight on the cushioned bench, as though to deny any hint of tiredness, but she had to be exhausted. We'll go straight to my rooms and order something to eat there, I said encouragingly. You can bathe while we're waiting for the food and then sleep. I shook my head, the horror of the feline's sudden attack striking me again. Masa, of all the things to happen, not so surprising, really, given the setting. Very surprising. I still can't believe you weren't injured. It wasn't hunting. It was startled. Startled hmm. by what? She didn't answer. Ooh. <laughs> oh, I love this for them. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, I, I feel like recently there's been a, a string of mystery solving X's in the readings on this show. I know that um, I think when uh, Juliet Kemp was on in, in mm. January, there was also 
uh, that dynamic, and that's always one of my favorite dynamics, like disaster exes who are just not quite <laughs> sure how to deal anymore. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, being a writer is so good. You just get to take the things that are that you like and then put them on the page and then other people get to read them. Oh, yeah, it's so easy. <laughs> I remember one time being like, intrigue sounds like such a great thing to have in a book. And then you try to write it and you're like, what even is intrigue? What am I doing here? <laughs> but no, it's, it's a lot of fun to kind of just think like, this is the book I want to see in the world. This is the book I want to read now and mm -hmm. see how it unfolds from the, the things that you want. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So uh, that, that leads really well. Uh, this being Tales from the Trunk, is there anything that you really loved from this book that just couldn't make it into the final release? Uh, so there, there were a few things uh, I think that I cut, um, but the thing is, <laughs> what, I, you know, I try to be thrifty about these things. And mm -hmm. so whenever I have to cut something, of course, I, I save it. And um, so most of the things that I had to cut, I think I threw into the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the sequel has just been announced. Uh, it's called The Imposition of unnecessary obstacles and uh Love this. And, yeah and so that uh, all the things that were about the world building or that i just didn't have time to fit in mm -hmm. um i kind of threw into the sequel and then now i'm in the process of taking the things that i had to cut from the sequel <laughs> and moving them into book three so <laughs> oh this is great that's so great and i just like just the lushness of the world building in this is just really like really tickled me i'm i'm currently reading i, I got an arc of emma Mieko kandon's the archive undying which is coming out later this year yeah i'm uh, looking forward to that one and just like getting to sink into that world building and then getting this world building is just like this was made specifically for me. I feel like there are just so many amazing books out there now that that mm -hmm. are coming out. Ugh, it's just fabulous. Like I keep reading stuff and just getting hit after hit. So yeah, it's great. Just all bangers mm -hmm. consistently. Um, so on on the subject of bangers is there anything without, <laughs> without being too Sorry. much of a spoiler <laughs> without spoiling too much is there anything that uh you just are thrilled made it into the final copy of this book yeah i mean on the subject of bangers i will tell you that the the meal that they mentioned that they've sort of promised to have together is at a restaurant called the slow burn um, <laughs> because it's very unusual for this place where the planet is literally made out of gas. This is a place that has cultivated a tiny forest that they can cook things over wood fires. Oh. And it also, you, you probably heard, I don't know how easy it is to pick up from a reading, but this institute that has regenerated all these animals, the, the slang nickname they have for it is the mausoleum. Uh-huh. So... I put a lot of puns in this book, and I, I don't appreciate that. that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with that. Um, and what else? I, you know, I, I think your, you know, the world building is the thing that I, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know. I shouldn't even say that because I love the characters and the story and stuff. But I do really enjoy world building as like an act of layering and sort of just gradually building out more and more details that make it interesting and fun and weird. Mm -hmm. And I had a ton of fun with that with these books because, you know, on the one hand, it's this very strange place for people to be living. Uh, mm -hmm. And we had to do a lot of figuring out how that would work. Um, and just thinking about, you know, these platforms and these trains and uh, the Atmos shields and, and sort of all the, <laughs> the sci-fi stuff. But at the same time, you know, I had in mind that this was going to be very Holmesian in tone. And mm -hmm. so... There's a lot of, you know, fogs wreathing by outside. But of Ooh, course, the fog yeah. is, you know, 
the gas from the gas giant. Mm -hmm. And there's huge storms, of course, because it's Jupiter, which has huge storms. Um, so I had a lot of fun with that sort of combination of um, a like semi Victorian sort of mm -hmm. feeling setting. It's just the sort of setting that would make you feel really cozy. Like it's cold out and mm -hmm. we're in a world where trains are the fastest normal means of transportation. Um, and there, the, there aren't really wireless communications because of the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So there's like telegrams, uh, where they lay the line along the rails. And so it's very, like, it was really fun to sort of play with that um, overlay of mm -hmm. something retro with something very futuristic. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I really love that. And it also like, you know, for for any sort of like mystery or thriller or intrigue, uh, it's really nice to just be like, yeah, there's no cell phones. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is definitely huge. <laughs> There's no cell phones. There's no GPS. Um, I've seen something somewhere where someone was like, it's getting harder and harder to, you know, realistically, plausibly be like, they're in a dead zone. Yeah. Um, well, this is one way to do it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, that was like kind of going back to the that golden age of detective stories mm -hmm. sense of like, you know, this is a world where people get around easily on trains. Uh, there are these universities that are kind of closed, not, not totally closed communities, but, you know, definitely have their own culture. Mm -hmm. um, you have these pockets. Um, the fact that they live on platforms also gives that, that sort of like uh, almost rural in the sense that like people live in these pockets and then there's space in between them. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of just really interesting aspects to it that, that I enjoyed playing with. Yeah. Uh, it also calls to mind uh, the... Uh, we we just had... We, I... <laughs> uh, I just had uh, Chelsea Polk on mm. uh, last, last month. Who knows? Time is fake. The... <laughs> February, yeah, the February episode, which is last month, because this airs in March, because this is the beginning of season five of Tales from the Trunk, which is wild. Woohoo! <laughs> uh, and, you know, wild that I d didn't even remember that to stick it in the beginning, but uh, <laughs> that uh, uh, their, their newest uh, release, even though I knew the end, is also like that golden age pulp detective uh noir feel yeah. there um that is on my tbr and we're actually doing an event together oh nice uh, yeah which is which is super exciting so it's march 9th at 6 p.m at loyalty bookstores which is a fabulous uh bookstore in the dc area so it's, it's a virtual event but um it should be i i think we're gonna have a lot to talk about yeah absolutely uh, so, listeners, if you are listening to this uh, on release date, which is March 3rd, then Seven. you have time to go to that. 7th, actually, but yeah. Excellent. March 7th. <laughs> March 7th, yeah, I think. I mean, who knows? Because, like, not yeah. only does time not exist, but they also change these things. I think it's March 7th. It's sometime early in March. Is this before there, the date of that event? Yeah. There will be a link in the show notes, so if you're listening to okay. this on release or very shortly thereafter, hopefully you can still make it. Yeah. Uh, that I, I'm, uh, I'm gonna definitely try to make it to that myself because that good. sounds awesome. Yeah, I think it'll be really good. Um, so before we, uh, before we get going, uh, a moment to promote uh, your other books, if you would like, uh, I know probably some people here have already heard of Inframocracy and its sequels, but uh, if you can give us just a quick pitch on that series. Yeah, I love to. Um, so Inframocracy is set uh, in the nearer future than the mimicking of known successes. It's in about 50 years. And um, nation states are outdated. Most of the world lives in what's called microdemocracy. Mm -hmm. um, there's this Google slash UN um, public institution called information, which kind of manages information flow, uh, mm -hmm. hardware and software all over the world. And 
there's an election coming up. Um, elections are held globally all at the same time and governments uh, sort of compete globally for these little juris small um, jurisdictions based on population instead of territory. And so every, like all of these big political parties as well as tiny political parties are competing everywhere in the world and uh, shenanigans ensue. <laughs> um, there are uh, chase scenes and katana versus flamethrower battles and also a lot of very wonky thinking about um, geopolitics and the possible new global paradigm and mm -hmm. what big data means for democracy and all of these things. And I do like to mention the sequels because I've had people sometimes say like, oh, there's more. Uh -huh. uh, let me make sure everyone knows. Um, there is Null States is number two and State Tectonics is number three. Um, there's also a prequel online short story. If you want to read it, it's called Narrative Disorder um, and it was in Fireside Fiction. And Ooh. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I also have a collection of short stories and poetry, um, which is called "End Other Disasters, and you can get it from Mason Jar Press or wherever you Fantastic. like to get your books. Yeah. Um, I, I definitely want to check that out. Uh, we love a small press here mm -hmm. and, um, I just shouts again to Informocracy okay. is just such a great book great series of books uh and uh, i know that's not the series title but i i can't remember off the top of my head it's okay series yeah. titles series schmidles as long as people can find it as long as people can find that's the important part mm -hmm. and, uh, and enjoy it so and yeah. and enjoy it yeah and that is malka older not Daniel Jose older, <laughs> different older entirely. Although you should read my brother's books too. They're very Yes, good. you should. <laughs> um, finally, before we get going, well, almost finally before we get going, uh, is there any media of any form that you've been consuming recently that you're just really pumped to get other people into? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, oh my gosh, like we were saying, there's so many good books out lately and... Um, so the ones that I've read most recently, I think that I'm super excited about are uh, Meru by S.B. Divya. Mm -hmm. um, super cool, like really interesting, hard science, great story within it. Um, uh, that and The Terraformers by Annalie Newitz. Yes. Uh, also like amazing setting. Um, it felt like there were some interesting parallels between those two books and also maybe mimicking. Um, mm -hmm with sort of the, uh, again, not to give away too much, but like, wow, we're really destroying the environment here. What does that mean for the far mm -hmm. future? Um, but they, they're they also very different, both of those books, uh, and really cool in how they imagine um, a very far future world and the people who live in it. Mm -hmm. um, and I also just read, although it's probably not exactly speculative, but I just loved A Scatter of Light by Melinda Lowe. Oh, Which yeah, is, I've heard uh, really good things about that. Yeah, um, really just wonderfully written, um, very engaging and and lovely in a lot of ways. Uh, yeah, those are the three that leap to mind, although I'm sure I'm missing some that I've loved. I mean, isn't that always <laughs> how it is? It, it really is. <laughs> I'm... I'm gonna be adding some things to my tbr right after this so uh you know all, all the blessing and curse of being a podcast host in this medium is you never never ever run out of things to read yeah lots of good stuff so well malka it's been such a pleasure having you on the show before we get going where can our listeners find you uh in the last days of twitter uh, and so far, still there. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm Who even knows older. what it's going to look I, like in a month? Like, <laughs> I don't know how to point people there, but like honestly, I have not found a place to exactly replace it for ranting about mm -hmm. stuff that pisses me off. So I am going to continue to do that for now, I guess. Uh, I'm also on Mastodon um, at Older at Wandering Shop. I'm. I've been trying to find other places. So I'm technically on Instagram uh, mm -hmm. under the at infomocracy handle. I don't use it a whole lot, but I do sometimes. And I've been 
uh, mostly lurking on Tumblr and very much enjoying it. <laughs> handle narrative disorder. I really like it. Like I find it so amusing and fun and creative, but then it's, I know people do rant on there, but I have not been able to quite find mm -hmm. the right way to rant. And, um, and it definitely doesn't seem to work the same way for promoting stuff that Twitter does. It's a very, it's just so different. All of them yeah. are so different. So anyway, um, we need uh, public information. Information is a public good. And yes. we should have a place that is not dependent on the whims of either billionaires or autocrats uh, that is able to, to be, you know, the kind of meeting place and sharing of ideas place and also news breaking and emergency information place and also like meeting people and chatting about things place that, that Twitter has been to a certain extent, ideally with better safety and yes. um, fewer como mierdas. But yeah, that's, that would be ideal. Uh, yes. <laughs> well, Malka, again, thank you so, so much for coming on. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's, it's been really Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Uh, listeners, stick around in two weeks when my guest will be Susan Palumbo. Tales from the Trunk is mixed and produced in beautiful Oakland, California. Our theme music is Paper Wings by Lillian Boyd. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash trunkcast. All patrons of the show now get a sticker and logo button, along with show outtakes and other content that can't be found anywhere else. You can find the show on Twitter, theoretically, at trunkcast, and I tweet at hbbisnyx. You can also find me on Mastodon at hbbisnyx at wandering.shop. If you like the show, consider taking a moment to rate and review us on your preferred podcast platform. And remember, don't self-reject. <laughs> <laughs>